Who knows there's some crazy stuff going on in our world. There's some crazy ideas being passed as conventional wisdom in our world today. Who knows the church today doesn't just need more trendy social media posts, doesn't just need better lighting and sound. What we need is to discover the book. What we need is to understand and hold to the Word of God. Well, I'm pretty excited today because we're starting a new series that's going to run on the 7th, 14th and 21st of July. And we're going to focus on uh, the primacy and the power of the Bible, the Word of God in our lives. And so we've called this series, Let There Be Light. Everyone say, let there be light. Kind of feel like God when you say that, don't you? Let there be light. And uh, the reason we've called this series Let There Be Light is because when you open the Bible, in the first few sentences of the Bible, the very first words that we read that are spoken from the mouth of God are the words, let there be light. And that's fitting because there has always been a correlation or a link between God's Word and light. The psalmist in Psalm 119 said it this way, the entrance of your word gives... The answer's on the screen, guys. It's really easy. (laughs) The entrance of your word gives light. And so this is one of the reasons why I love the Bible. There's so many people who are going through life and it's like they're stumbling in darkness and they're, they're not quite sure, and they're speculating about what God might be like, and, and they're kind of in the dark about, well, what's God's will for my life, and what does God want for me, and, and how can I know? And there's so many people, it's like they're going through life walking in darkness when you really don't have to, because the entrance of God's Word brings light. And so as we start to open God's Word in our lives, It helps us to see. It helps us to see what God is like. It helps us to know God's intent for our lives. It helps us to get a grasp on God's will and purpose for us individually, for our homes, for our relationships, for our church. And so I really think in this series, Let There Be Light, it's going to help all of us to have just more confidence when it comes to not just navigating a Bible, but understanding God's will and intent for our lives. So in this series, we're going to ask some questions and answer some questions like, well, what is the Bible? Who knows? That's a good question. What is the Bible? Uh, Why should I trust the Bible? How do I make sense of the Bible? Where do I even start in the Bible? Uh, But we're going to wrestle with some of those questions over the coming weeks. And I really think it's going to help us. Um, You will have seen a QR code on screen. Uh, If you've got the Bible app, the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, you can scan that QR code now and the team will hold it up there for a moment. And uh, no matter which campus you're in, uh, you can get the notes for today's message so you can track along with them, discuss them in your connect group. And I think that'll be a great blessing to you. But I want to start the series by preaching a message I've entitled, Discovering the Book. Discovering the Book. We're going to turn in a moment to 2 Kings 22, and uh, it'll be on the screen. We're going to read about a king uh, who was part of the kingdom of Judah, and his name was Josiah. He, he lived in about 640 BC. He's considered one of the greatest kings in the history of Judah and Israel. And the scene we're about to read is the hinge upon which his life turned. It's the reason why he was able to be one of the great leaders in Israel's history. It says this, 2 Kings 22 verse 1 says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. I've got an eight-year-old and he thinks he reigns. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His na- mother's name was Jed- Jedidai, Jedidai, yep, that, and she was the daughter of other great people. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, son of Meshullam, the secretary to the house of the Lord, saying, go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the ha- threshold have collected from the people." And so what's happened is they're literally doing a renovation program. I I think they've just done their expansion offering and uh, they're about to embark on a building program to renovate the temple. That's what's happening. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I've found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan, the secretary, came to King Josiah and said, your servants, they were emptying out the money that was found in the house and have delivered into the hand of the workmen. Uh, Jumping on the Shaphan, the secretary told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Discovering 
the book. Uh, around 300 years ago, the French writer and philosopher Voltaire proclaimed, 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible on earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. Well, 100 years later, Voltaire's old home in Switzerland became a storehouse for Bibles. And in a delicious twist of irony, the same printing presses that had been used to print his anti-religious pamphlets were now being used to print Bibles. Who knows, Voltaire is not the only person to take aim at the Bible. You may well be in church today in any one of our locations and you think the Bible is outdated, irrelevant, or untrue. The anti-theist Lawrence Krauss dismissed the Bible as being nothing more than the product of Bronze Bronze Age peasants. Richard Dawkins describes the accounts in the Bible of Jesus' resurrection and ascension as being as well documented as Jack and the Beanstalk. But for all of its opponents, it's amazing how the Bible simply refuses to die. The Bible remains the most published book in the history of the world, bar none. In comparison, the best-selling novel of the 21st century are the Harry Potter books. And uh, the Harry Potter books, there's over 500 million copies in print. So, So Harry Potter comes in second. Doesn't that say something about us as a society? But 500 million copies, Harry Potter, The Bible, in its lifetime, it's estimated it has been printed five to seven billion times. In fact, every second someone's picking up a Bible, 70 Bibles a minute are being printed just by one print house located in China, the atheist country. And so the Bible is unlike any other book. The Bible is the most read, the most translated, the most outlawed, and the most stolen book in human history thanks to the Gideons who leave those free copies in hotel rooms. But, but what's really curious to me is not the Bible's prominence, and it's not even the Bible's existence. What's really curious to me as a pastor is the trends around people's engagement with the Bible. Now, if I was to do a pop survey across Calvary today in East London, in Townsley, in any one of our locations, and I was to say to anyone in church today, do you believe the Bible is a valuable book? I reckon probably 95% of people in church today are going to say, yes, pastor, absolutely. The Bible is an incredibly valuable book. And then I have a follow-up question. My follow-up question is, okay, excluding Sunday, excluding today, have you read the Bible in the last week? And a, a couple of proud people in town are going, yep, well done. Um, I noticed the front row was pretty quiet, but anyway. Um, <laughs> if I was to say, have you read it? Like Monday to Saturday, have you read it? It would probably get a bit quiet. It might even get a little bit awkward. That's because studies show that of consistent churchgoers. Now, consistent in this study is defined as once a month. Okay, so of con- now I think it's probably better than that is consistent. But for this study, consistent was going to church once a month. Of people who go to church once a month, only 8% read the Bible once a week. So we're not talking about non-believers here. We're not talking about people in the community. We're talking about consistent churchgoers. We're talking about people who would identify themselves as believers in God, people who could point to a pastor and they know their pastor by name, and people who go to a local church. Of that contingent, 8% 8% read a Bible once a week, which, 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 well, by the way, it's worth noting that those studies are in America, <laughs> Americans, but it's probably not too different in South Africa and Australia, which means this, it means that 92% of people in church today have lost the book. They've lost the book. So, so actually, we're not unlike the people of Josiah's day that we read about earlier. In Josiah's day, they believed in God. They had a priest or a pastor and they knew his name. They had a a local temple church. In fact, they were so committed to their local temple or church, they were doing a renovation of it. So so they believed in God. They would call themselves believers or worshippers. They had a pastor. They had a local church. And yet in spite of all of that, they had lost the book of the law. 
And consequently, as a nation and individually, they were stumbling in darkness. And so the turning point in the kingdom of Judah, the turning point in the life of Josiah was when Hilkiah burst into his office one day and said, I found something. I have found the book of the law. I've found God's Word. And how many people would be honest enough to say that if they needed to rediscover the book then, how much more do we need to discover the book now? Who knows, there's some crazy stuff going on in our world. There's some crazy ideas being passed as conventional wisdom in our world today. Who knows, the church today doesn't just need more trendy social media posts, doesn't just need better lighting and sound. What we need is to discover the book. What we need is to understand and hold to the Word of God. So all of those studies got me thinking about this. If 92% of consistent churchgoers aren't reading the Bible, the logical question is, how did we lose the book? Because they lost the book. It wasn't that they didn't go to church and it wasn't that they didn't have a priest, but they lost the book. So if they lost the book, we probably could lose the book as well. And so how is it that 92% of us have lost the book? i got a couple of thoughts. Here's the first thought. I think some of us have lost the book because to be honest, we never found the book. We never found the Bible. Um, I love church on Sundays. I love church on Sundays because um, I, I love the worship and I find the, the talks inspiring and uh, <laughs> today's is pretty good. And um, joking. And I like the community. I love the social factor. And, and perhaps you're in church today in East London or Townsville and a friend invited you along to church and you're like, you know what, I actually like this. And I come along and I meet some positive people and there's a good energy in the room. And I like connecting with people over coffee. And when they do my favorite song, sometimes I lift my hand and sometimes I say amen after the, the, the prayer things. Uh, but it's so kind of, I'm vibing with this Christian thing. Uh, let me just say, if that's you, Praise, I'm thrilled that you're here. Like, that's fantastic. But my encouragement as your next step would be to start to engage in the Bible for yourself. Because if if you're coming to church and you're hearing a, a, a preacher talk about the Bible, that's good, but you're restricting yourself to a secondhand Christian experience. It's like this, if someone just comes home from a holiday in Hawaii and they're like, oh, the climate, the warmth, the food, the beaches, the water, oh, it was all beautiful. Who knows that's good, but it's far better just to go to Hawaii yourself. And and it's good to come to church and someone tell you about God and God's ways and God's will, but it's far better when you can open the Bible and start to have God by His Spirit speak to you through His Word Himself. Because here's what I've noticed, the Bible is unlike any other book book. Now, I've found that as I've opened the Bible and started to read it for myself, it's like words jump out of the page and slap me in the face. Anyone ever had that? It's like you're reading, you're like, bang, man, where did that? And it's like, whoa, like it's just like, whoa, how did that? And, and I've read other books, uh, you know, picture books, stuff like that. I've read. I read other books and I like other books and I like the wisdom that you can get from them, but the, there is no book that relates to me like the Bible. That's because the Bible is that the claim of Christians is that the Bible is actually inspired by God's Spirit. We're going to talk more about this in the coming weeks, which means this, the same eternal Spirit of God that inspired, that superintended the writing of Scripture is the same Holy Spirit that illuminates, that turns the lights on, leads us into truth today so that as we read the Bible, we're not doing it on our own, but the Holy Spirit can speak to us and speak truth into our hearts. Let me tell you, your life will change, not just when you hear a preacher, but when you hear God speak into your own heart through the book. We speak to God in prayer. He speaks to us through His Word. And that's how we come to know God. Here's the second reason why I think we've lost the book. Some of us are confused by the Bible. All right, honesty time. Can't lie. We're in church. Um, Put your hand up if you've ever been confused by the Bible. The Bible has some parts in it that are really confusing. And sometimes in church, we do a disservice to people because people say, okay, I want to follow Jesus now. We're like, awesome. All you need to do is go home and read the Bible. And so they're like, oh, there's a big book. So I'll just like flick to a random there. And uh, let, me, let me tell you what you might land on. Deuteronomy 28 verse 27. Uh, the Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors and scabs and itch of which you cannot be healed. Wow, I received that. I'm feeling encouraged. What about this one? You do another eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Ezekiel 4.15. Then he said to me, see, I assign to you cow's dung instead of human dung. 
on which you may prepare your bread. Well, I just became gluten-free. I'll be fine. Like, like you just say, well, just, just read the Bible. Well, it's a bit more complex than that because there's historical and cultural elements to it that need to be understood if you're going to understand the Bible. Um, we run Alpha in all of our campuses. Some people come to Alpha because they're investigating the Christian faith. Others come because they've recently made a decision to follow Jesus. Runs on Monday night. It's a great initiative in uh, our church. And so there was a lady from our Sunshine Coast campus who came along to Alpha, I think early last year. She hadn't been to church yet, but someone had given her a Bible and she had started reading it. And so she thought, I'm going to come along to Alpha. She heard about it. So she turns up to the first night with her Bible and says to one of our pastors, Mike, I've got, I got a Bible and I've started reading it. It's amazing. Like I'm reading it from the start, Genesis, and like talks about God and how God created everything and how God made us. And man, it's amazing. I'm loving it. He's like, that's fantastic, Rochelle. Keep reading. So she did. She comes along a few weeks later and she doesn't even say hello. She slams the Bible on the table and she goes, I've stopped reading this book. I'm not going to read this anymore. What the hell is wrong with Lot's daughters? Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, let me fill in the blanks. You get to the 19th chapter of the first book, and it tells the episode of a guy called Lot. His wife dies. He's got two aging daughters, and they both don't have husbands. And so they decide we need to, you know, ensure our posterity. So on successive nights, we're going to get our dad drunk and sleep with our own dad, and that's in the Bible. And so she slams it on the table, and she says, those two, and uses a word that I won't use from the pulpit. They get their dad drunk and then sleep with him. And this is in your Bible. What the heck are you reading? And, and Pastor Mike responded beautifully. He said, that's exactly how you should feel. That you, you're meant to be horrified as you're reading that. Because it's not just his moral examples that you should follow. Moses has included that to let the people of Israel know how that nation was formed. And so Rochelle kept persisting, kept coming back to Alpha, kept asking questions. You know, at the end of Alpha, Rochelle got water baptized last year and today is still part of our church on the Sunshine Coast. Let me tell you this, even though the Bible is sometimes confusing, it's worth persisting with the Bible so that you can start to make sense of it. And we're going to talk more in this series about how we can do that. And uh, one of the messages we're going to do in this series is uh, about the story above the stories so that you can piece it all together and make sense of what you're reading. But let me encourage you, it's worth the work to keep reading the Word of God. Number three is this. Is this helping anyone today? Number three is going to get challenging now. Some of us have lost our appetite for the Bible. Some of us are like, uh, to be honest, I've not lost it. I know where it is. I've got the app on my phone or it's sitting under a pile of magazines next to the couch in the lounge room. I've, I've got, it's in the top drawer next to my bed. It's not that I've lost it. I've just, I've just lost my appetite for it. Who knows when, when we lose our appetite for the word of God, that should be a concern. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so if one of our kids loses an appetite, that's normally a sign that they're unwell. Because when they're well, they eat chicken nuggets like they're going out of fashion. But when they're unwell, they don't eat. And so when a Christian has stopped consuming the word of God, it's probably a sign that something is off. Is this making sense? Um, here, here's why I think it happens. You lose your appetite for good food when you start eating junk food. Like mum says, hey, come over. I'm going to cook a roast. Oh, praise God. But then you get a bit hungry on the way. And as you're driving to mum's place, you see those golden arches. Hallowed be thy name. And you just think, oh, they're calling me. And so you just think, I'm just going to duck in for a quick cheeseburger. Just a quick cheeseburger. And then they ask you if you'd want fries and it would be rude to decline. And so you have some fries as well. And then maybe a McFlurry. And so then, then when you get to mum's house, I can see people nodding. I might just do an altar call. I sense conviction in the room. Mum then serves up the roast. And to be honest, you, you kind of, you pick at it a bit, but you've lost your appetite. Why? Because you've been feeding on so much other, well, could we be honest enough to admit that some of us are feeding on so much other junk that we've just lost our appetite for the Word of God? But the Bible says, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word so that by it 
you may grow in respect to salvation. One of the surest signs you know that God is at work in someone's life is they've got an appetite for the Word of God. Number four is this. Some of us have avoided the Bible. Some of us have avoided the Bible. Um, so, So the reason why the kingdom of Judah had lost the Bible, whether they lost it or whether they concealed it, uh, I don't know. But the reason why they lost it is because they had been under the rule of evil King Manasseh, who was into a whole lot of other things. He was into astrology. He was worshipping the stars. He was worshipping a Canaanite goddess of fertility, and he had turned the temple into a brothel. He had sacrificed his own son to the Canaanite god Molech, who required child sacrifice in order to be appeased. And so, No wonder he lost or maybe buried the book of the law. Because when you are living in a way that you know is not pleasing to God, you kind of are pretty happy to conceal the Bible. Does that make sense? It's like if you know that you're not living within a budget and you're spending beyond your means, the last document you want to sit down in front of is a budget. Why? Because the budget is a mirror that reflects back to you who you are. And, and the Bible is also like a mirror that reflects back to us who we are, not to condemn us, but to reveal our condition so that we can be healed and restored. But here's the point. Sometimes we lose the Bible because actually we don't want to be confronted by the Bible. You don't have to amen. Just look straight ahead. Uh, number five is this. Some of us are distracted by things other than the Bible. And to be honest, I think this is probably the majority of us. You know what? I, I love God and I like the church and I'm committed and, and I'm a Christian, but, but just life gets in the way. We get busy with stuff. I mean, there's bills to, to pay and there's groceries to get and there's work and there's meetings to prepare for and there's family commitments and there's, you know, Netflix and there's all of these other competing pro and we just get busy. Well, Jesus actually said this is exactly what can happen in our lives. Jesus said in Mark 4 verse 19 that sometimes the Word of God can be choked out of our life because of the worries of life, the lure of money, and the desire for other things. And some of us today would say, you know what, upon reflection, I have stopped engaging with the Bible, and it's not because I'm in gross sin, it's just things have gotten in the way. Let me encourage you, that, that you and I will only ever be fruitful in our faith if we allow the Word of God to be front and centre as a habit in our hearts. In East London, they're standing on their feet, clapping, cheering, throwing money at the pulpit, but I got one clap in Townsville. I'll take what I can get. Woodrow, Woodrow Kroll says this, and it's a challenge. Check this out. He says, I remind you that God wrote a book, and he only wrote one. I wonder what we'll say to him at the judgment seat of Christ if he asks us, did you read my book? I mean, one time in your entire life, did you read my whole book? (laughs) Who knows, that's going to be an awkward moment, isn't it? He only wrote one book and we've got a whole life. Did you ever read the book? Oh, but I really love him. Yeah, I know, but, but feelings aren't always a reliable guide to reality. He wrote a book. Oh, I just really want to know God. He wrote a book. Oh, I really want to know God's will for my life. He wrote a book. Oh, I really want God's wisdom. He wrote a book. Some of you are like, yeah, I get the point, all right? He, he wrote a book. And so you and I don't have to be in the dark. God, God wrote a book. And we, we want answers, but we don't want to open the book. Who knows, the surest way to have God speak to you is to open the book and see what God has already spoken in his word. And so here's what I'd love us to think about. How might your life change in the next month if you discovered the book? Not just come to church, not just lift your hands in a worship song, but but how might your life look different if you discovered the book? I, I mean, how might your levels of anxiety change if you just took 10 minutes each day to discover the book? How might your relationship with your family change if you took 10 minutes each day to discover the book? Oh, it's gotten quiet in the house of God this morning. How might the atmosphere, how might your engagement with your colleagues change if you just downloaded God's wisdom into your heart and mind for 10 minutes each day? How might your perspective shift? Here's a thought. How might the atmosphere of Calvary Church change 
if every Sunday thousands of people turned up to church who in the preceding six days have opened the book? I tell you, we would have revival in East London. We would have revival in towns where we would see homes shifted, hearts healed, wisdom downloaded. Why? Because we discovered the book. And so my encouragement for all of us today is, what's the place of the book, the Bible, in our lives? Let me share with you three results as we bring this to a close. Three results when we discover the book. There were three obvious results in the kingdom of Judah when Josiah discovered the book. Number one is this, the first result when we discover the book is this, repentance. Now, repentance is sometimes a word that comes with a lot of negative baggage. Repent! But, but repentance is not a heavy word. Repentance is a joyful word. Repentance is a gift. You see, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and all of his life he'd grown up in a culture of moral confusion and compromise. Josiah just, he just didn't know any different. He thought the way he was living was just normal because that's how everyone else was living. But then 22 verse 10 says that when Josiah heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Now that was a, a, a cultural habit of expressing sorrow and remorse. In other words, as the book is read, he realizes, I'm not living how God wants me to live. And so he starts to repent by tearing it, then uh, chapter 20, 23 verse 2 says, Josiah read in the people's hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statues with all of his heart and all of his soul. Here's the point. Many of us in church today kind of just assume the way I'm living is fine because everyone else at my workplace is living this way and everyone else in my business network is living this way and everyone else in my family line has always li lived this way. So I just figure it's cool. Like God hasn't struck me with lightning yet. Must be fine. But, but what happens is when we open the book of the law, we start to expose our heart and mind to his thoughts and to his ways. And we start to get perspective and realize, man, maybe the way I'm living is actually not all that God intended. There's a, a preacher in America. He's one of the most prominent preachers in America. He didn't grow up in church. And he tells the story of he was 18 years of age and uh, had a girlfriend, was sleeping with his girlfriend. She was a backslidden pastor's daughter, and she gave him a Bible as a gift. Well, he had never read a Bible, so he started to read the Bible, and he learned an F word that he had never heard before, fornication. He had to look up what it meant, and he realized, I'm sleeping with my girlfriend, and that's not what God wants. And, and so it wasn't a preacher who pointed a finger in his face. As he opened the word of God, conviction came into his heart, and he rep repentance is just saying, I'm wrong, God, your ways are right. He changed his ways now he's one of the most prominent uh, voices uh, as a preacher in the church in America. The point is this, it's far more powerful when you open God's word and God convicts you of your lifestyle than when a preacher points a bony finger in your face and says, stop doing this or that. This is the amazing thing about the word of God. As we start to read his ways, his principles, his thoughts, his pattern for our life, we realize that, you know what, I am missing it in some ways. And so now I can repent and start to walk in a different direction and walk in a way that pleases God. Anyone here ever had rats or mice in your house? No. Oh, wow. Anyone here? Just give us a wave. All, all the rest of us humans. Renee's never had rats in her house. It's all right. We can arrange some this week. Sarah and I stayed at an Airbnb with our kids last year. We're on holidays and the photos looked amazing for the Airbnb. We get there, there's rats. And, and here's the thing. You go out for a meal, the lights are off, the rats come out. You come home, you turn the lights on, what happens? Whew, the rats scatter. Well, I kind of think that happens in our life as well. That there are behaviors, attitudes of the heart, thoughts, actions that in the dark, all good. But then when we turn on the light, when we open the word of God, it's amazing how some of these attitudes get confronted and they start to scatter. Some of, let's be honest, some of us in church are dealing with habits, things that we want to shake, vermin, when it comes to our lifestyle. And we think, I just need more discipline. I need more of this or that. Can I suggest to you today, what you need is to sit under the light of the word of God. Because as you open the word of God and let God start to speak to you, it's amazing how those things 
start to be removed from your life. Number two is this. So firstly, there was repentance. Secondly, there was a reformation. There was a reformation. You see, because they had lost God's book, they had lost God's standard, God's way. All types of crazy living were becoming mainstream in Josiah's day. And it doesn't take a prophet to point out that there's all kinds of craziness that has become mainstream in our world today as well. But as Josiah and his generation opened God's word, it actually triggered a reformation. Chapter 22 says they discovered the book of the law. Chapter 23, the little heading says Josiah's reformation. And they needed a reformation because cultural syncretism had taken place. Cultural syncretism, it is where the people of God start to adapt the views, the values, and the lifestyles of the surrounding pagan culture to the point that you can no longer distinguish the difference between the people of God and the people in the world. And who knows, if there is a Christian, they might have a church, a temple, a pastor, they might have all of that, but if their lifestyle and their views and their values are indistinguishable to secular culture, that's a sure sign that that Christian has lost the book. Because it's the book that brings reformation into our lives. You do realize that you are being formed every waking moment. Every time you turn on the news, you are being formed. Every time you listen to a song on Spotify or Apple Music, you are being formed by the values in the lyrics. Every time you watch a movie, it's not just entertainment. There's a set of values and ideas that are forming and shaping you. It's called information for a reason because the content you take in forms and shapes you. It shapes your values. It shapes your assumptions. It shapes the way that you look at life. And some of us are so informed by secular culture that we are deformed as followers of Jesus. You can be in church, have a local church, have a pastor, and yet be spiritually deformed because you're taking all of your formation from secular culture. And in Josiah's day, they were, yeah, they called themselves the people of God, but they were deformed. They were not formed into the people that God wanted them to be because they were taking all of their cues from culture. Who knows, we need the church of Jesus to be formed into the image that God had in mind for us. Every time we open the Bible, we allow God's thoughts to form us. We allow God's paradigms to shape us. Who knows, we are called to be shaped into the image of His Son, Jesus. And so that's why we need the Word of God to inform, reform, conform us to the image that He designed us to be in. Can you say amen today? We need the Word. Some of you are like, oh, I don't really need the Bible. Are you kidding? You need. You are being formed daily. I need the Word of God to form form me into the person God created me to be. There's a, there's a group called the Center for Bible Engagement, and they've spent decades researching the effect of regular Bible engagement in the lives of Christians. By Bible engagement, we mean reading or listening to the Word of God. And, and here's what they've discovered. They've discovered something called the power of four. It's going to be on screen. They've discovered this, the life of someone who engages Scripture four or more times a week looks radically different from the life of someone who does not. In fact, the lives of Christians who do not engage the Bible most days of the week are statistically the same as the lives of non-believers. Someone who engages the Bible four or more times a week is 49% less likely to get drunk, 51% less likely to engage in sex outside of marriage, 51% less likely to view pornography, 43% less likely to engage in gambling, 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness, 228% more likely to share their faith with others, 407% more likely to memorize scripture, and 231% more likely to be discipling other people. Isn't that amazing? The studies have shown that one to three engagements with the Bible doesn't have such an impact But once a person engages at least four times in a week with the Word of God, the stats are literally wild. Why? It's because you and I are being formed by something. And I want our church, I want you, my prayer for you is that you would be shaped and formed by the Word of God by engaging with the Bible at least four times in a week. Is this making sense? So so there was repentance. There was reformation. They started to be formed into a people that resembled what God intended. And then finally, there was restoration. 
Repentance was acknowledging, God, my ways are wrong and I need to walk in your ways. Reformation was clearing out all of the negative that needed to go, but then there was restoration. When we get to chapter 23, verse 21, it says, Josiah restores the Passover. This was something that God had instituted for the people of God. It was a principle, it was a pattern for the people of God that had been lost for generations. Even though it was part of God's plan for his people, it had been lost for generations. And Josiah had probably never really grown up properly celebrating the Passover, but then as he opens God's word, he sees God's patterns and God's principles and the paradigms that are meant to be part of the life of the people of God, and he starts to restore them back into the landscape of the nation of Israel. And here's the thing, there'll be people in church today, maybe in East London, maybe here in Townsville, and you've not grown up in a church environment. Maybe you've grown up in all manner of dysfunctional environments, and and, and you don't have these, these patterns and principles. You've never had it modeled to you, like Josiah, of how to establish and build up a godly life can I encourage you? It's time to discover the book of the law. It's time to discover the word of God. Because firstly, it realigns our walk. We start to repent and walk in God's ways. And then it reforms us. It clears out everything that isn't honoring. But then what it does is it restores us. I've found that as we open the Bible, it starts to instill godly paradigms and patterns. It it teaches us about forgiveness and worship and stewardship and faith and servanthood and excellence and covenant and keeping our word. It, It starts to build line upon line, layer upon layer, these practices and principles and patterns into our life that cause us to be the kind of people who can attract God's favor and blessing into our life. Paul said this, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. There is a power in God's word to build us up, to start building our lives to be the people that God always intended us to be. Can you say amen today, church? Let me close with this Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite historical preachers. He said this, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to a person who isn't. What might change if you discovered the book? So here's what, some of you are like, I know where you're going with this. You want me to read the Bible, don't you? Bingo. Of course I do. Because you and I will never have a strong relationship with God if we don't have a strong relationship with the Bible. In fact, you will lock yourself into vulnerability, immaturity, and ignorance. You might feel the feels when you come to church on Sunday, but you'll be ignorant, weak, and vulnerable as a Christian if you never read the Bible. And so over these few weeks, we're going we're gonna to grow in this together. If you scan the QR code on screen, it'll take you to a link tree. And there's a couple of resources there. You can get the notes from today's message, but you can also um, pop your email address in there because next, or next Monday, or Sunday, next weekend, We're starting a 21-day Bible reading plan. Some of us are like, I'm inspired, Dustin. Where do I start? Well, you can talk to any one of our team after the service, but if you pop your email in there, we're going to do 21 days in the Gospel of John. There's 21 chapters in John. We're going to read a chapter a day, and we've had 21 great people from across our church write a daily devotional to help you to make sense of what you're reading, and together we could read the Gospel of John. That's kind of one of the best. Don't start at those other crazy verses I read earlier. That's going to confuse you. But if you start in John, I promise you there's nothing about baking bread on excrement or anything like that. It's going to be a lot more user-friendly. And so you could sign up for that, and we're going to put more resources on that link and grow in this together. You could join Alpha. That would be a great place to start. And my prayer is just that all of us, no matter where we're at in our faith journey, we would just double down in our resolve to say, you know what, I'm going to put the Bible front and center. It's going to make it a habit in my life. You watch what God does when you discover the book. Come on, let's lift our hands to heaven. Father, we thank you that we don't have to live in the dark. Thank you that we don't have to just speculate, guess as to what you're like. Lord, I thank you that you've revealed yourself to us. Lord, you've given us your word. Father, I pray that even this week, as we start or restart this habit, Lord, I pray that your word might speak life and faith 
and hope into our hearts. I pray that as we read your word, it would be like a windshield getting cleaned and washed. We would start to see things more clearly and we would start to feel peace and joy and, and, and perspective. God, I just pray as we read your word, let your Holy Spirit be in every home, every kitchen, every bedroom, every place where the people of God open your word. Holy Spirit, would you be there? Would you be present? Would you illuminate? Would you lead us and guide us into truth so that we can be the people that you've called us to be. I pray all of this. I pray your blessing and grace in East London, here in Townsville as well. In Jesus' name, amen.